Have you ever had someone say to you, I have some good news and some bad news? Which do you want to hear first? How many of you want to hear the good news first? How many the bad news first? How many of you just don't care? You just don't want to be in that position at all to hear either one of them. Sometimes to understand and appreciate the good news, we have to know what the bad news is. We're in a Christian season of Advent. Advent literally means the coming or the arrival. For us as believers, Advent is associated with the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth to provide salvation by his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Believers today look forward in anticipation to the second advent of Christ, in which Christ will return to the earth in a bodily form to receive the church and judge the nations. The term advent also refers to a season of the church year during which the church prepares to commemorate Christ's first coming to earth, Christmas. The first four Sundays before Christmas Day make up the Advent season. That's why sometimes Advent begins in November, like it is this year. Other times it's in December. Have you ever been singing a song for years and then you discover that a phrase you've been saying for years and singing for years is not really what it is in that song? You catch yourself saying, I never heard that before in that song. Sometimes things that seem so familiar are distortions of what's really being stated in a song. Sometimes we learn Christmas carols at an early age, sing them without knowing what they really mean. I remember for years I sang Deck the Halls with Boughs of Holly. I had a dolly, it was chewed up by a collie. And I thought for years that was how it went. I never realized. One of my favorite songs now is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Thank you for singing that this morning. It's one of my very favorites. Who is Emmanuel? What exactly is he supposed to do when he gets here? The tune of that song causes the emotions of sadness and hope to rise up in us. It's obvious that things are going to change when Emmanuel arrives. Emmanuel literally means God with us, and it's only found four times in the Bible, three times in Isaiah and once in Matthew chapter 1. And in both places, there's a struggle going on with a person, and they don't know exactly what to do or where God is at that moment. God's people were known. They were known as the nation of Israel. They would often disobey God. They'd go after idols to worship. And at times, God would let them suffer the consequences of their actions. This often meant being defeated at the hands of nations around them. But as a nation, they would often only seek God when they were in trouble from warring nations. Instead of seeing God as the almighty God, worthy of praise and honor, They kind of kept God at a distance until things got really bad and they had nowhere else to turn. They wanted God, but not the one that expected them to live a righteous lifestyle. In our reading from Isaiah, the king of Israel at the time was King Ahaz, and Jerusalem was his capital city. Two armies had surrounded the city and held it captive, but they could not overthrow it. King Ahaz had received word that they had contacted a third king to come and help them to overthrow Jerusalem. So he and the people in the city were terrorized with fear. King Ahaz himself was not walking with the Lord. He was doing a number of things God had ordered never to be done. Ahaz had even sacrificed one of his sons in a fire to a pagan god. Yet with all he had done contrary to the word of God, God had compassion on him and the people. God sent Isaiah to him to let him know that his enemies would not prevail. They would not enter the city of Jerusalem. And the people being held captive in the city would indeed be set free. 
So Isaiah asked the king, what sign would you like to see to know that God was doing this? The king refused to ask for a sign because his pride wanted to continue handling things his way. If he asked for a sign and got it, then he knew he would have to admit he was not serving the Lord. Sometimes when we ask God for a sign, we don't want to accept the changes required of us when the sign comes through. So Isaiah said, I'm going to give you a sign so that when it happens, everyone will know that God is the one who brought about deliverance. Isaiah told him, a virgin will have a child who will be called Emmanuel. And by the time the child is two years old, the nations attacking Israel, they would be destroyed. When people heard about Isaiah's prophecy, no doubt they looked forward and most likely prayed that this child, Emmanuel, would be conceived and come to them quickly so that they would be granted deliverance. The second time we see the name Emmanuel show up is in the Gospel of Matthew where we're introduced to Joseph. Joseph was called a righteous man. He was looked forward, looking forward to his upcoming completion of his marriage. He was engaged to this beautiful young woman by the name of Mary. They had their official engagement. Their parents had exchanged the dowry and gifts. They were now in a one year waiting period between the engagement and the final wedding banquet. The couple lived separate and apart for the year, which was a guarantee that the father would be the father of whatever child was going to be born in the marriage. This stage of the process was one of such commitment that you would have to get a legal divorce as a couple to go your separate ways. Well, Mary had come to Joseph with some good news and some bad news. The good news is that God had sent an angel to her to let her know that she would giving birth, be giving birth to the Son of God, who would save his people from their sin. The bad news is that they didn't have much time to get ready for everything because she was already pregnant by the Holy Spirit. How many of you are thinking what Joseph might have been thinking? There's some worse news than they didn't have much time to get ready for the child? Keep in mind, Mary had been out of town for three months visiting her aunt Elizabeth. What would you do, gentlemen, what would you do if your fiance went out of town unpregnant and came back pregnant? You know that the two of you had not come close to having sex and the only name that she'll give you is the Holy Spirit. Since he is convinced Mary's story is not true, and she had betrayed him, Joseph's life goes into a tailspin. What should he do? This child coming into his life was an absolute disappointment. It's amazing what God can do with our disappointments if we do not give up hope and remain faithful. Joseph could have let his anger determine his next step, but he didn't. He really wanted to do the right thing. When it all boils down to the bottom line, Joseph has three choices. Number one, he can publicly humiliate Mary because of what he perceives to be her immorality. The choice could possibly lead to her death under the law because she would be found guilty of adultery. Choice number two, he could divorce her quietly and just walk away from her leaving her to raise the child in shame and poverty. Choice number three, he can marry her, raise the child as if it was her own, of, pardon me, he can marry her and raise the child as if it were his own. This last option was rarely chosen. Joseph, being a righteous person, needed wisdom to make a decision. Unfortunately, he made a compassionate decision but it was not the best decision. Joseph originally decided to divorce Mary quietly without making any accusations, but that meant he would have to take some of the financial responsibility for raising this child. He obviously cared for Mary. As the scripture says, 
he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He also knew that in taking this route, he would be putting his own reputation at stake. Many would believe he was the father of the child and had backed out on the deal for some unknown reason. Had he found somebody else? There would be plenty of speculation going around. Sometimes even when we have the facts all in front of us, we still can't see or understand the whole picture. God may be up to something in a situation that we simply cannot understand with our earthly wisdom. The Gospel of John does not give us an account of the birth of Jesus, but it does begin with letting us know that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word for logo, the word for word is logos in the Greek. It is associated with knowledge, reasoning, and wisdom. In our hymn this morning, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the third verse of the song asks for wisdom to come from on high and to put order in all things. Wisdom is to show us the path of knowledge that we need in order to go in the right direction. Joseph didn't know it, but God had preordained this union between him and Mary, and God was going to see that it came to pass. Just when Joseph was about to feel okay with the course of action, he was about to take, God sent him in a different direction. God sent wisdom from on high through an angel in a dream who explained to him the rest of the story. The scriptures tell us, starting in verse 20, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I believe that Joseph was wanting some kind of direction from God so that he could know that God was still with him, even in the midst of all what seemed like a terrible loss. God gave that dream to Joseph. Anybody else could have, con could have dismissed it as wishful thinking, or too many broccoli at supper, or whatever. The point is that even when it seems as though God has forgotten us, because of God's silence, God is still looking over our situation. God is feeling our pain. God knows when and how to intervene. Joseph was not going to let anybody try to talk him out of what he had dreamed. He was willing to go, humble himself before Mary, beg her forgiveness for not believing her. He was willing to endure the scorn, the ridicule of others who would label him as the guy who just couldn't wait until the wedding night. He wasn't as righteous as they had first thought. Joseph's goal was to get back on track, thanks to the wisdom that had come from on high. When he woke up, he went to Mary and took her home as his wife. But they waited until after Jesus was born before they had relations with each other. The Holy Spirit uses Matthew to connect the event in the Old Testament with Isaiah and King Ahaz to the New Testament event of Mary and Joseph. In writing the Gospel of Matthew, verses 22 and 23 go, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. There are several things that happen in the scriptures that have double meaning, connect to prophecies about the Messiah of the Christ. We see this double meaning of an event again in the Old Testament when God calls his son out of Egypt, referring to God's people. Then in the New Testament when God tells Joseph to take Mary and Jesus out of Egypt and back into Israel. The writer lets us know this is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Hosea. Now that Mary and Joseph are reunited, they could look forward together to the coming of this child. There's no doubt in either of their minds that Jesus is going to be different. The angel that came to Joseph in the dream gave Joseph the privilege to give him the name of Jesus. For it's this child that will save his people from their sins. 
When God called Abraham in the Old Testament to create a people for himself, Abraham became the father of the Jews. Abraham was at first a Gentile who looked like everybody else. But when God first called Abraham and gave him a promise, the promise was not simply for the Jews, but for the whole world. God told Abraham in Genesis 12, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples of earth will be blessed through you. I want you to see that God has never given up on reaching his people from all groups all over the earth. In the final stanza of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, we see the cry for the desire of nations to come and to bind all people in one heart and mind. My friends, this is exactly what Jesus has come to do. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female. You are all one in Christ. God revealed in the coming of Jesus that we could all be reconciled with God. God has since given us this ministry of reconciliation to let others know that God was working in Christ to reconcile the world to himself. Even our worst, in our worst moments of sin, God's goal is to bring us back to himself. There is a world that needs to know the goodness and the mercy of our God. This year, use Christmas as a time to tell others the good news of why Jesus is coming. For we share the goal of reaching the world for Christ together as believers. The good news of Advent and Christmas is that a Savior who will forgive our sins is coming into the world. The bad news is that we're all in desperate need of a Savior to be saved from our sin. But don't you know it? Far too many of us want to deceive ourselves into thinking we really aren't all that bad. Sure, we fall short here and there, but overall, we're pretty decent individuals. The cross of Jesus says otherwise. It wasn't the birth of Jesus that cleansed us from our sin. In connection with Advent and Christmas, the scriptures tell us that Jesus shall save us from our sins, pointing towards the future. Jesus' birth was miraculous in that he was born of a virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit. But that was required for him to be put in the position for our sins to be forgiven. For only a perfect sacrifice could remove the penalty for our sin. The crucifixion of Jesus lets us know that our sin is more than just a mistake or a bad choice or something else trivial that could easily be wiped away was the painful death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. The nails going through his hands and feet, the beatings with the whip, the crying out of, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is finished, the shedding of his blood, the burial and then the resurrection that removed the penalty for our sins. The whole purpose for Emmanuel to come was to change our situation in relationship to God. When our relationship to God changes, then we can have true, meaningful relationships with one another. The peace that we often sing about at Christmas is found, first of all, in knowing Jesus Christ for ourselves and understanding the meaning of Emmanuel. Knowing that God is with us no matter what is going on or what is going to come our way. This Christmas, as you look at your own life, where do you need to invite Emmanuel to come and make a difference today? Is your home full of envy, strife, arguments? Emmanuel's presence brings peace. Inviting him in today can change what the next few weeks of Advent and Christmas are going to be for you. Is there something you need to let go, like Joseph did, in order to discover God's plan for your life? Invite him into your disappointments. Invite him into the areas where something has you bound and makes you captive. Invite him in to your brokenness and allow him to have your singing rejoice. Rejoice, 
for God has ransomed you. Amen.